Hi, my name is Stuart Love. I'm the District Wildlife Biologist with Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife based in the Charleston Field Office. The following is a presentation of hunting regulations and issues that have been proposed or adopted by the Fish and Wildlife Commission. Uh, information we'll be providing in this video will, be, will pertain not only to statewide hunting regulations and issues, but also to local issues in the Umpqua Watershed District, which is primarily Coos and Douglas counties. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Dominic Rocco. I am the Assistant District Wildlife Biologist in Charleston. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the changes specific to migratory birds and the new trapping regulations, so uh, as well as upland game birds. So for most of the upland game birds uh, and, and the migratory birds, the, the structure, the season, bag limit stuff, that it's all pretty similar um, to how it was last year. We, were, we managed those uh, upland game birds on a five-year framework, so a lot of that stuff won't change until uh, probably 2025. So the only real notable change is uh, the change to the daily bag limit for the general Western Oregon fall turkey season. So that has been increased to, to allow uh, hunters to take two turkeys per day um, with the season limit remaining the same as at two turkeys for your, uh, for your season bag limit as well. And then the other one is uh, sports pack holders are now uh, able to select from general spring, general Eastern Oregon fall, or general Western Oregon fall. So previously, sports pack holders were held to um, only uh, selecting for the general spring tag. Uh, some of the, the considerations for the 2023-2024 uh, duck season opener dates. So these are um, these are these are proposals right now. They're not they haven't been adopted, and so we we uh, would solicit some, some uh, input on some of these things, and, and I'll present a few options uh, in, in the next slide. But, but basically, for the past 30 years, uh, the department's been able to offer um, these, these different zone, uh, zone openers for, for the opener of the duck seasons. Um, and in 2023, uh, based on the opener of the, league, the any legal weapon um, buck deer seasons, we're not going to be able to, to offer the same hunt structures as we have in previous years. So um, we will, uh, I'll present a, a couple of those options, um, but, but based off the federal framework, we still need to end the season on January 31st. And so it's, it's just kind of where we are right now. So the first option would be no change to the current uh, opening day structure. So, you know, this would be the, 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 the structure we're currently running on and zone two would continue to open the Saturday after the any legal weapon buck deer season opens and uh, opens concurrently with the upland seasons. In zone one, uh, the seasons would continue to open on the following Saturday, but only when the buck seasons open on either October 1st, 2nd, or 3rd. Uh, in years when the buck seasons are, are pushed back and the opener is on October 4th, 5th, 6th, or 7th, the duck seasons and the upland game bird seasons would all open concurrently which would be that second Saturday in October. Uh, the second option the department's considering is holding concurrent duck openers uh, in all years on the second Saturday of October, um, and then close zone one on the last Sunday of January every year. So under this option, zone one, two, and the upland seasons would all open the Saturday after the any legal weapon uh, buck deer season openers. So that, that would happen in, in, in every single year. And, and additionally, the, the split would be extended from the three-day split in zone one um, to 10 days. Um, and, and that would be so that we could end on that last Sunday in January every year. Uh, and then option number three would be uh, holding different duck openers um, and then closing the zone one on, on January 31st. And that would be regardless of, of uh, you know, what day of, of week that fell on. So uh, zone two would open on the second Saturday in October, and then zone one would open on the third Saturday in October. Uh, zone one season would end on the 31st, and this, again, this would be regardless of what day a week. So, so you know, a, a few years it wouldn't end on a Sunday. Um, and then uh, zone one would have fewer weekends under this option, so uh, 15 um, <clears throat> uh, rather than 16. So. Um, those are just a couple options, and we're looking for some input on that from, from the public. 
So in addition, there's some changes to the trapping requirements as well. And these are specific to the, to the amount of time you have to check on your different trap sets and then uh, for, for, and for beavers as well. So, so for all trap sets uh, or that are set or used for taking fur bearers or protected mammals and restraining traps or snares set or used for taking predatory animals, those must be checked at least once every 48 hours. For uh, kill traps, your gear that is set for killing the animal uh, of predatory animals, those must be checked at least once every 14 days and, and all the animals must be removed out of those as well. Some changes to, uh, for, for licensed fur takers, um, if you're not acting as an agent addressing damage and you're not the landowner, so, so recreational trapping, on property that is greater than 5,000 acres, uh, which is considered a, a large forest land, those pelts uh, from beavers removed from large forest land are not able to be sold or exchanged. Um, if you're under that 5,000 acre requirement, uh, you're, you're still allowed to sell those hides. For those beavers that are taken through, through the licensing process, um, through a licensed fur taker, there's gonna be some additional details that are required uh, after you do harvest that animal. So these are going to be specific to the reporting location on, on where the animal was taken. Uh, it's going to be land ownership, you know, whether that was taken on a state, federal, or private property, the reason for harvest, um, and then, then more specific, we, we kind of want to know the river, stream, you know, drainage, uh, general area on, on where that beaver was taken as well. So those are, uh, again, those, those were adopted and those are going to be uh, the current structure moving forward. Hello folks, my name is uh, Nick Liadetti. I work in the Roseburg office and I'm the assistant wildlife biologist here. Uh, today we'll be talking about some uh, changes coming up to the 2003 mule deer management plan. Uh, it's currently under revision. Uh, one of the biggest topics they're going to be covering is the mapping of herd ranges. Um, also a new table of contents will be developed so if you're, if you're looking for these updates and you want to participate in this, uh, there'll be stuff on our website this summer, and the final draft for public input will be uh, in 2023. So uh, as I mentioned, mentioned before, uh, one of the big topics for this plan revision will be looking at draft herd ranges. And this uh, slide here shows some of the movements based on winter range to summer range that the collared mule deer have done. And this data is going to be used to uh, draft those herd ranges, which will will show you an idea of how that's going to look here in a moment. So yeah, this is the the draft plan for the herd ranges based on that telemetry data and GPS collar data. Um, you can kind of get an idea how this looks across traditional wildlife management units. And uh, at this point, they're looking at still continuing with the standard wildlife management units for all of our tag numbers and hunting season. So if this is a topic that you guys want to participate in, uh, just stay tuned to our website. The link there is below and uh, anything new will be posted there and opportunities for comment will be uh, notifications during that time. So now we're going to get into some of the draft proposals for the 2023 regulations. Um, one of the big ones coming up is going to be looking to move the correction period for control hunt applications from what currently is now June 1st to May 25th. Uh, if this is done, draw results will come out on June 12th and the application deadline would still remain May 15th and this would not change any spring bear deadlines. So with this, this current 2023 proposal information, um, we're going to be looking at the season frameworks and season dates. Uh, so for a generality, these seasons will all be a week later than they were in 2022. A good example of that is the any legal weapon buck season will start on October 7th during the 23 season. Uh, so down below are listed some of the anticipated dates for those different seasons you'll encounter. So this is a, a rough summary of the tag changes proposed for 2023. 
Overall, it's only a 1% increase in for tags from the year of 2022. Deer is going to increase about 2%, mostly due to youth tags. Elk will be a 0% increase. Pronghorn, 0%. Bighorn is a 14%, mostly from youth tags. Mountain, load, mountain goat is a 3%, and bear will be a 2%, mostly in the, the North Cascade units. So to continue on with some of the proposals, this is our buck deer proposals. Um, for 2023, there will be an addition of two controlled late season blacktail hunts, the Wilson and the Dixon. Uh, later on in this presentation, we will get more in depth on the Dixon hunt. Um, another proposal would be to delete the Starkey 152B, also to include a new Southwest Control Archery buck hunt. It would be in early August and be similar to what other states offer for high country uh, early season mule deer archery. Uh, another one would be new youth buck hunt in the Mount Emily unit. And the final one would be to open the powers for traditional bow only during the late season archery framework. And we'll also include more information on that towards the end of this presentation. For the antlerless deer in the 600 series, um, there's going to be some slight increases in tags in the northwest and northeast hunts. You can see the links below this presentation to see the uh, hunt table numbers, and that'll give you an idea of what's happening with those numbers there. For elk in the 200 series, the current proposals are a new youth controlled archery elk hunt. Uh, this would be valid statewide, except for the big five, Walla Walla, Wanaha, Mount Emily, Chesnimus, and Sled Springs. Currently it's recommended at 300 tags. This would allow youth to participate with this tag with other family members, regardless of the unit, not counting the big five. Um, in addition, two animalist hunts and one any legal weapon hunt would be added in the Starkey. Uh, a muzzleloader only hunt in Catherine Creek is proposed. Additional any legal weapon tags in Lookout Mountain, but this would also reduce tags in, in existing uh, one elk bag limit hunts. Also, Delete two antlerless and one youth tag that are no longer needed for damage issues. And uh, finally, shift the cascade muzzleloader season back one week. Next up is pronghorn. Uh, really, this is only pertaining to Beatty's Butte. Uh, it's going to be looking to restructure some of the hunts to account for some changes in antelope distribution and water sources. Um, the first up would be to delete. 470A, 470B1, 470B2, and replace with a two unit or two hunts that are unit wide, similar to the current structure for other antelope hunts. Also, we would be deleting 470R2 and replace it with a unit wide hunt. And finally, uh, delete the 470M, the muzzleloader tag in Beatty's, and replace it with a Steens Mountain opportunity. For the bighorn sheep and mountain goat proposals, uh, it's fairly simple. Uh, delete the Wanaha Rocky Mountain bighorn hunt. Increase California bighorn ram and ewe tags. There'll be a link to see those numbers in the hunt table. And uh, add one tag to the Rocky Mountain goat elkhorn number one, number two, excuse me, 950A2. And finally, uh, gray squirrel Bag limits and seasons are listed under the big game regulations, but we are proposing no changes to these hunts. One other topic that we'd like to bring up is that uh, hunters harvesting bears and cougars are still required to check in. Uh, our offices are all open now, so please call and make an appointment and we can get those checked in. Those samples are vital for us to uh, monitor cougar and bear populations based on our bear and cougar plans. Also, with the uh, positive test for chronic wasting in Idaho, uh, we are going to be stepping up our surveillance here in Oregon for the disease. So uh, we'll, we'll probably see more mandatory hunter check stations. Uh, if you do harvest an animal and you'd like it sampled, make sure you re reach out to your local ODF&W office. Hi, my name is Todd Lum. I'm the Douglas District Wildlife Biologist. And we're going to talk about our local um, big game topics that pertain to the Umqua watershed. Um, this, this graphic here just depicts the southwest region, the wildlife management units that are currently out there. 
and everything in orange that you see is currently available as a late archery deer hunt for bow hunters during the general season. This slide depicts the areas that are open to uh, late season muzzleloader hunts through controlled hunts, and those are the wildlife management units that are colored in tan. So the reason for the previous slides were just to show you the late season hunting opportunities in the southwest for deer. And um, the Dixon unit has never been a part of that up until this next year we're proposing to offer the Dixon unit as a late season buck hunt for any legal weapon. Another new hunt being proposed for 2023 is uh, several wildlife units, the Dixon, Applegate, Evans Creek, and the Rogue for an early bow hunting opportunity um, that would begin before the general season and that would be your only opportunity as a controlled hunt. Hi everyone, Stuart Love from the Charleston Field Office again. I'm going to talk about deer and elk hunting in the area that's, that's covered under my district, uh, starting out with Roosevelt Elk in the Tioga Big Game Management Unit, uh, the 2023 tags are based on uh, where, where our populations are with respect to management objectives for uh, bull ratios within the populations. So the objective for, bull, for the bull ratio in the Tioga Big Game Management Unit is 15 bulls per 100 cows. We've been hovering fairly close to that. So our recommendation for the 2023 season is to maintain tag numbers for the two any legal weapon seasons at 900, season, 900 tags per season. We did recommend a slight increase to the tag numbers for the Tioga muzzleloader hunt. We, we're, our recommendation is to go from 220 tags to 275 tags because we do anticipate the bull ratio may rise slightly as a result of uh, maintaining tag numbers at 900 for the, the past two seasons, that being 2022 and 2023. Another issue I want to make hunters aware of is for those who may be applying for the powers unit archery tag for archery elk tag, that if you draw that tag, it's no longer what we consider to be a transportable tag. What, me, what that means is that if you draw that tag, that tag is good for the powers unit for elk hunting only. It's not good for other units surrounding powers or any place else in the state. Then finally in the powers unit, uh, the bull ratio in that unit has been slightly low. Uh, we're becoming a little bit concerned about it and trying to pull that bull ratio back up again. The objective for bulls in the Tioga, or I'm sorry, in the powers unit is 10 bulls per 100 cows, and we're hovering down around seven. So our recommendation for 2023 is to reduce bull hunting a little bit uh, by reducing tag numbers by about 15%. So the, for the first season, powers in powers unit, uh, the recommendation is to go from 400 tags in 2022 to 330 tags in 2023. For the second season of powers, the recommendation is to go from 105 tags in 2022 to 92 tags in 2023. And then finally, for the uh, powers unit bow tag 226R, our recommendation is to go from 63 tags in 2022 to 59 tags in 2023. As for deer in the Charleston Wildlife District, uh, ODFW is proposing putting the powers unit in the list of units that would be open during the general late bow deer hunt uh, in Southwest Oregon. Uh, only that if that hunt, that unit will be open for hunting with uh, long bows and recurves. So it's a, it's a traditional bow hunting unit only. So what that means is that if a person has a general season archery deer tag, they can hunt during the late general season in that unit on, with that tag. They've just got to use longbows or recurves. They can also hunt in other units that are open during the late season with other traditional archery tackle, with other archery tackle. Uh, the bag limit in the powers unit during that hunt will be one buck with visible antler. Then in the sixes unit, uh, we're recommending that the sixes unit muzzleloader deer tag uh, number be increased in 2023 from 61 to 83 tags. Uh, and this is because what we've seen over the last few years is deer numbers seem to clearly be increasing in the sixes unit. 
And then a few things I wanted to cover related to access for hunters in, in my district. Uh, in the Tioga unit, we have an area called the Coos Mountain Access Area. Uh, that's an area where uh, vehicle travel is, is controlled during certain times of the year. It, uh, vehicle travel is allowed on arterial roads, but not on the smaller side roads that would go out to landings and that sort of thing. So uh, starting in 2022, uh, the, the restrictions related to that are in effect from August 1 through December 31, which means outside of those dates, those restrictions are not in place, which means you can drive on any open roads. But during the, the times from August 1 through December 31, uh, people interested in, in spending time in the Coos Mountain Access Area are gonna be restricted to what we are calling green dot roads. So those are roads that have a green reflective dot posted on the road sign at the beginning of those roads. Another thing is uh, with respect to the Coquille Valley Wildlife Area, which is a wildlife area in uh, Southern Coos County uh, near the, the town of Coquille. Um, we have two different tracks, or we manage the area in two different tracks. There's the Beaver Slough Track, which is open to access, public access, seven days a week, all days of the year. Uh, and then the other tract is the Winter Lake Tract. The Winter Lake Tract is open to public access seven days a week, uh, from February 1 to August 31, but outside of that time period, during the hunting seasons, access is only allowed in the Winter Lake Track Wednesdays, Saturdays, Sundays, state and federal holidays. So that's from September 1 through January 31. So this concludes our presentation related to hunting opportunity in the Umpqua Watershed District. If you have uh, questions or need clarification on any of the information that we've, uh, we've presented, please don't hesitate to contact us, either, either myself, Stuart Love, I'm in, in the Charleston office, you can see my contact information there, or Todd Lum, he's in the Roseburg office, you can see his information as well. Then in addition to this, at the bottom of the screen, you should be able to find links to information uh, the, that should help clarify any of the, the information that we've provided. And also you should be able to find links for providing comments to uh, the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife on the information we've provided. We really are interested in hearing information from you, hearing your input and hearing your thoughts on these proposals and uh, have a good hunting season. Thanks for watching.